MBA from George Washington University. He's also a flight test engineering graduate of the USAF Test Pilot School and a registered professional engineer and a fellow of the American Institute of Aeronautics and Lots of big words, big guests. Please welcome you. Thank you, David, and good evening, everyone. It's great to be here. And I'm really excited about having the opportunity to talk about one of my favorite topics, which is the future of commercial space management. Ever since the Soviet Union sent Yuri Gagarin, there were more than 50 years ago, almost all of the significant milestones and major accomplishments that we've seen in space by government. Whether we're talking about the SCP program, Project Mercury, Project Gemini, Apollo Moon landings, 30 years of flying the space shuttle, building, living, and working on board the International Space Station, it's been the government that was responsible for planning, developing, and executing the program. Well, Going forward, that is not necessarily going to be the case because private industry is playing an increasingly important role in our space programs. And tonight, I'd like to talk a little bit about why that's happening and what kinds of things we're likely to see in just the next few years. A little bit of background first. If you look at things from a very highest level, the U.S. space program really has three different sectors. The civil sector, led by NASA, and has included operations in the space shuttle, working on board the International Space Station, and all of the effort being devoted to the Mars and so forth. The military sector, led by the Air Force, has included the launch of defense communication satellites, GPS navigation network, a variety of sensors and other systems that are intended to support our security. And there's the commercial sector, which is pretty much everything else, including the launch of telecommunication satellites, resources, direct broadcast TV, and space tourism. The commercial sector really had its formal beginning back in 1984. President Reagan issued an executive order, and Congress followed up with the Commercial Space Launch Act. Established the Commercial Space Transportation, which at that time reported directly to the Secretary of Transportation. 1995, the office was moved over to the FAA, where today we're one of the lines of business, as we call it. We've got a two fold mission. First of all, to ensure public safety during commercial launches and re entries. And secondly, to encourage, facilitate, and promote. Commercial space transportation. So those are the two things we keep in mind with you a little bit today. <laughs> One of the most important tools that we have in our toolbox for the safety part of our mission is the requirement in the law that any US citizen or company that wants to conduct a launch of a launch vehicle anywhere in the world needs to have a license from our office. And the only exception to that is for launches that are being conducted by and for the government. So NASA did not need an FAA license on their plane or shuttle. The Air Force doesn't need one if they're carrying out the launch of their military missions. But anybody else, big or small, older new, needs to work with us. Altogether, there have been 311 licensed or permitted launches over the years, and all of those have been completed without any fatalities, significant injuries, or property damage to the general public, which is what we're charged to protect. <coughs> we oversee a number of different kinds of operations, launches from the ground, from the air, from the sea, we handle both spendable launch vehicles that are used once and discarded, and reusable launch vehicles that are flying by one again, both suborbital rockets that just go up to the edge of space and back down, and orbital ones that take satellites on the way of the Earth. We also oversee on-sites 
sometimes follow a space for us. And there's actually 10 FAA licensed space force in the US today. There's the one shown in blue here. There's Houston Space Force, let's see. Yeah. Uh, the interesting thing is, they're all different. Some of those space ports are like your traditional on sites with the launch pad and entry towers and they're designed to support expendable rockets going out over the ocean and taking some <coughs> space. space. Some of the more recent space ports to get their licenses look more like airports. They have runways and hangars, and they're intended to support the horizontal takeoff and landing vehicles that we're seeing and hearing more about in recent years. There's also a number of other locations that are knocking on the door right now asking what they have to do to get another option. One of the most significant steps in dealing with where we are today with commercial space really called the attention of the public to commercial space was the Ansari X Prize. I don't know if you have heard about that, but perhaps you didn't know how that came to the meetings. <coughs> was sitting around talking with some of his colleagues about how aviation had developed over the years. And they were noticing that in the years after Charles Lindbergh first flew the Atlantic received the Ortega Prize, the number of airplanes, the number of pilots, and the number of people who flew in an airplane every year just took off. And they said, you know, that's what we need for space. Something like that. So they came up with the idea of having a million dollar, ten million dollar prize for the first non-government entity that could design, build, and demonstrate a system capable of taking three people up to the edge of space, altitude of 100 kilometers, come back to Earth safely, and then use that same vehicle again and do that same mission a second time to show that it wasn't just a stop, it wasn't just a, a one-time operation, but could actually form the basis for a business going forward. And so when they announced that prize, they got a lot of attention all over the world. There were actually 26 different teams in seven different countries that registered for the prize. And a wide variety of different concepts were put <coughs> In the end, though, it was famed aviation designer, Bert Rattan, who came up with a very strange looking contraption, a carrier aircraft called the White Knight, a spaceship called Spaceship One. And in the fall of 2004, they took off from Mojave Spaceport in California, climbed up to about 40,000 feet, released the spaceship, left the rocket engine. <coughs> Zoomed up 200 kilometers and glided back for a runway landing. And they did that same thing a few days later. So they won the prize. And where is Spaceship One now? It's right across the street from my office in the Smithsonian Air and Space Museum. And the Dell X1. place there, right? Why, why would they put it there? Because it was a really big deal. Because it demonstrated that today it no longer takes a government with thousands of people and billions of dollars to build a spaceship. And that was a real aha moment for a lot of people when that happened. It was like, oh my goodness, the world has changed. Now maybe this is something that we can do and make a difference in space. Another important milestone was the retirement of the space shuttle. So it's been six years now since the final flight of the shuttle. And the reason this is an important milestone is that NASA has now committed to relying on private industry to get food and clothes and scientific experiments and eventually as astronauts to and from the space station. And because those are going to be commercial
Let's talk a little bit about why we have a space program in, in the first place. Why does the government have a space program? Well, there's a variety of different reasons that have been talked about over the years. National security, technological leadership, international competitiveness, scientific curiosity, maybe inspiration for students. Okay, a lot of different reasons. But how about if you're not a government? How about if you're a person or a company or an association? Why would you want to have a space program? Could be some of the same reasons. Some people may just be passionate about space. And there's a few who think, you can make money doing this. I know a lot of you know Neil deGrasse Tyson, famous astronomer and host of the Cosmos TV show, and he has observed that, in his opinion, the first trillionaire that we're ever going to see is going to be the person that figures out how to exploit natural resources from asteroids. So I don't know if that's true or not, but we're seeing an interesting dynamic take place now with wealthy individuals. If you look at the 2017 Forbes billionaires list, there's currently 2,043 billionaires in the world, 565 of whom are in the U.S., so there's a lot of wealthy people not in the U.S. And if you look down the whole list, those of us in aerospace would, would recognize several of the names there, right? Paul Allen, one of the founders of Microsoft, he was one of the funders for scaled composites when Robert Chan won the Ansari X Prize. He's also formed his own space company, Stratolaunch, that we'll talk more about in a minute. Jeff Bezos, head of Amazon, who's now the second richest person in the world, and he has his own space company called Blue Origin. Richard Branson, Virgin Galactic is one of his companies. Elon Musk from SpaceX. And there's others who aren't even billionaires, but they're well-to-do, and they put a lot of their own money on the line, including people like Robert Bigelow, who made his money in the hotel business, and formed Bigelow Aerospace. He's building destinations, habitats. Dennis Tito, the first person to pay to go into space, who rode a Russian rocket to, to visit the International Space Station. And John Carmack, who formed Armadillo Aerospace. These are people that they didn't necessarily pay for everything. They put their own fortune at risk, though, and helping to make things happen because they believed in it. I think it's important to keep in mind, though, that we're not talking about a black or white thing. It's not one or the other. There's plenty of opportunity to have government needs be met by relying on what industry can bring to the table. So what does government have? Well. They have a lot of smart people, a lot of expertise, a lot of experience, and a continuing need for products and services. How about an industry? Well, I'd say that there's at least a potential for lower cost, right? Most people would admit that private industry can do a given task less expensively than the government effort to do the same thing. There's at least a potential for increased innovation because those of us in, in government tend to like to do things the way we've always done them, right? There's at least a potential for greater risk tolerance. Government tends to be very risk averse. Don't want to take chances. And then there's a potential for new customers, new markets. Those are things that the government doesn't even think about. And the potential for new sources of investment and funding. Well, if private industry is so good, how come we don't do that all the time? The reason is there's a catch, isn't there? The catch is to get that type of benefit, the government has to be willing to back off a little bit and not necessarily have so much control over exactly what we do and how we do it. And that's uncomfortable. So the message is if those of us in government can be a little bit less comfortable and not insist on having complete control over these programs, if you do that well, you can have a pretty neat result sometimes. So that's the challenge. It's not easy, but that's where we ought to aspire, in my opinion. 
Perfect example. I know many of you heard about EFT-1, Exploration Flight Test 1. That was back in December of 2014. Big important test of the Orion spacecraft that NASA hopes to use eventually in this deep space exploration efforts. But you know what? NASA didn't really carry out that mission, at least not the way it normally does space flights. United Launch Alliance had a launch license from the FAA for their Delta IV Heavy to fly into space. And Lockheed Martin had a re-entry license for Orion from the FAA. And NASA was the customer. They bought lots of data from Lockheed on how Orion functioned, how the heat shield worked, how the avionics, avionics functioned, and so forth. Well, why would NASA do it that way? That's not the way they normally do it. Because to use this approach, it was a lot faster and a lot less expensive. And it worked out as a win-win for everybody. Another great example is, is what we ended up doing <coughs> for commercial cargo. It's something called the COTS program. And COTS, in this case, wasn't commercial off the shelf, but commercial orbital transportation system. Special innovative program that NASA had a few years back that was intended to see what industry could do. They had space act agreements with a couple of country, companies. And for a grand total of $800 million, which is you know, about the cost of a single shuttle mission, what we ended up at the end of the program with was two new launch vehicles, one from SpaceX and one from Orbital APK, two new spacecraft, two launch sites, two mission controls, and all the infrastructure you need. And both of those companies now have successfully completed several successful missions delivering cargo to the International Space Station. And NASA helped to bring that about by the way it structured the program. Along the way, we're seeing a lot of innovation, too. For example, SpaceX ended up developing something they called the Autonomous Spaceport Drone Ship. It's basically a, a high-tech barge. We've got two of them, one on the East Coast, one on the West Coast. And they sail this out from the launch site a few hundred miles. And then when they're doing a launch with their two-stage Falcon 9 rocket, when the rocket gets to the appropriate altitude and velocity and separates the stages, the second stage goes on to orbit. First stage turns around, fires the engine in again, and then lands on the barge. <coughs> so you can sail it back into port and inspect it and reuse it. And they have now done that 16 times, nine times landing on the drone ship, seven times actually landing at landing zone one at Cape Canaveral. But here's what it looks like when <laughs> the first stage of the rocket lands. It is incredible. If you haven't seen the videos, check it out on Google. It's amazing to see that happen. It's just not natural to see a rocket coming back and land vertically like that. Pretty amazing stuff. And the hope is that eventually they'll be able to reuse these rockets a number of times. They've a couple times reused the stage for a later flight, but at the very least, they have the chance to go in and inspect and see what areas maybe had a little extra wear and tear, which might be more margin, <coughs> might have more margin, and what kind of changes they might want to make to the design. That's going to help us to have safer, more reliable, more cost-effective rocket designs in the future. And this is all being done not because NASA told them to, not because the Air Force told them to, but because SpaceX says, you know what, this is what we need to do to bring the cost down so that we can have <coughs> more people do good things in space. We're seeing a similar type of thing when it comes to commercial crew. Right now, we've got the cargo part down, but when we want to send our astronauts to the space station, we basically have to hitch a ride with the Russians after the retirement of the space shuttle. And every time we do that, it costs $70 million per seat to do that, which is terrible. So NASA has contracts now with two companies, Boeing and SpaceX, to try and have that capability come back to the U.S. again. And both Boeing and SpaceX are working very hard on that. Boeing has 
something called the Starliner. Looks like an Apollo capsule, but it's got new materials and new structures and new avionics. SpaceX is basically going to use the, the Dragon capsule that they're already using for, for cargo delivery, but upgrade it a little bit, put in some, some new avionics and life support systems, some seats and a crew escape system, and they'll be using that system for their eventual crew transportation flights. So how are we going to handle overseeing those flights? Well, a few years ago, Bill Gerstenmeier from NASA and I signed an agreement that basically said, here's how we're going to do it. We're going to have the FAA license these missions, and we'll be responsible for public safety, in other words, the safety of the people on the ground. NASA will be responsible for the safety of their employees, the NASA astronauts who are flying on board, and for mission assurance. So that's how we're dividing things up, at least for right now, and that partnership is working very well. NASA has also done a very good job of looking around and finding facilities that are excess or underutilized these days, and there's a lot of those things around. We had some very nice facilities that were used at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida when we were flying the shuttle. A couple of them were called Orbital Processing Facilities, or OPFs. And now one of those has been given a new paint job, and Boeing is using that for a final assembly and check out for their Starliner capsules that will be taking astronauts to orbit soon. SpaceX has signed a 20-year lease with NASA to use Launch Complex 39A. That's one of the launch pads that we used when we had the Apollo moon landing flights, and which the shuttle also used for many of their missions. And now. SpaceX is launching from that location. You see the processing facility at the base of the ramp there. And there's a whole bunch of uh, used first stages stacked up <laughs> in that facility right now. And that's where they do their final checkout before launch now. NASA has already identified some of the astronauts that will be flying in the first commercial missions. Doug Hurley, Eric Bowe. Bob Benkin and uh, Sonny Williams, and they're working with both Boeing and SpaceX right now, and learning all about the, the spacecraft that they will hopefully be flying. And the target date for that is next year, so it's coming up pretty quick. At the same time, there are different companies with different vehicles, different missions, different customers, and they're focused on suborbital space tourism. There's a half a dozen companies right now that are working with our office and are building, designing, testing systems that are going to be capable of taking people up to the edge of space where you're going to be able to look out the window and see black sky and the curvature of the earth and experience the magic of weightlessness. And that's going to be really special. Now we know that not all of these companies are going to be successful. Some of them will run into technical difficulties. Others will run out of money before they get to the end. There's enough really smart people to work on this and there's enough people change the way we think about space, because it won't anymore just be a handful of highly trained, specially selected government employees that get to go to space. It'll be whoever can afford to buy a ticket, right? And right now it's very expensive, but the price is going to come down as soon as those things start flying and we see some competition. The companies will be crazy to lower the price now because there are hundreds of people lining up to put down deposits and sign up. There's like a thousand people who have signed up to fly with these companies already and they haven't even started flying. But it's more than just view graphs right now. We've got some real hardware out there. 
Virgin Galactic had their upgraded systems from the systems that actually won the, the X Prize several years ago. White Knight 2 is the carrier aircraft, Spaceship 2 is the spaceship, and they've completed six glide flights with the system now, and they expect later on this fall to restart their, their rocket power testing so that by next year they hope to be selling tickets for those missions. When they get done with the testing out at Mojave, they'll be packing up their bags and moving out to Spaceport America in New Mexico. That's sitting there waiting for them. You can see the runway there, and that building in the foreground is a combination terminal hangar facility, and that's where Virgin is going to have their headquarters of what they like to call the gateway to space for the space tourism operations. Blue Origin, which is Jeff Bezos's company, has a different approach. They have a, a system called the New Shepard, and they're flying this from West Texas out in the boonies. And they take off vertically, and then the capsule separates and comes down under a parachute. The booster then falls back into the atmosphere, relights the engine, and does a soft landing vertically, much like the, the Falcon does when they fly back the first days, except this is right on the land. They have already done this without any people on board five times with the same hardware. So they have, hope to have several other test flights and then they'll be ready to put some people on board and again, start selling tickets. That's coming soon. Now, if you'd like to have the view, but you're not so sure about all the noise and vibration you get pushed back in your seat, there's some companies <coughs> There's also a number of companies that are not focusing on the rocket, they're focusing on the training. You used to have to be a NASA astronaut to get some of these experiences. Well, not anymore. You can go to NASCAR outside Philadelphia, and they will spin you around in a centrifuge. They've got it hooked up to a computer display so that it's like you're looking out the window and it would feel just like you would feel if you were doing one of those suborbital space missions. Or they can sit you in the altitude chamber with an oxygen mask and a helmet on and you know when you fly on the airliners and you get the, the faces to you about in the event of a sudden change in cabin pressure, so you know when you're all mass will come down? Well, you get to see what that's like and recognize your symptoms for hypoxia so that you can be prepared if uh, an off-dominal event happens during your space flight and you'll be better prepared and hopefully uh, ready to have a safer flight. You can talk to Zero Gravity. They have a, an aircraft that they fly parabolic on so you can experience weightlessness for 30 seconds at a time, just like NASA has done in its training. And if you want to talk to Waypoint to Space, they'll even put you in a spacesuit and let you see sort of what a spacewalk would be all about. These are all available now to the public. Coming up in the next few months, SpaceX hopes to have the first flight of what they call Falcon Heavy. It's basically three of those Falcon 9 rockets that they're flying today strapped together with a, an additional second phase. That'll be the, the most powerful rocket in operation in the whole world when they start flying that. And Elon Musk, head of SpaceX, has been convinced by some of his wealthy colleagues to allow them to buy a ticket for a lunar flyby at the end of next year, which would be an interesting anniversary of the Apollo 8 mission that flew around the moon. Uh, that's a pretty ambitious timeline, and 
bunch of things have to go well to get there. But the fact that this is being done by a private company as opposed to the government, pretty interesting. I just came back from uh, the International Astronautical Congress meeting in Australia, and Jan Werner, who's the Director General of the European Space Agency, has been talking a lot lately about something he calls the moon village. And when you hear that term, you, you think, oh, well, there's, you know, 100 people in a colony or something like that. And he says that that's not what he really has in mind. But he's talking about having, instead of a top-down project with a schedule and a budget and all this that is completely organized by the government, it would be more of a bottoms-up gathering, just like villages and towns happen on the earth, right? You get a, a baker and a repairman and a gas station and a restaurant and everybody just decides to be in the same place. And so he says, well, you know, we can have robots, we can have rovers, we can have some scientists, we can have some astronauts, we can do some mining on the moon, we can have solar power, we can do all kinds of things, but it doesn't have to necessarily be one big giant project that's coordinated by a single country or a single space agency. Other things that uh, are being talked about, Blue Origin, again, that's Jeff Bezos' company. He, they're flying the, the new Shepard now, but he has more ambitious plans. A rocket that they intend to build called the New Glenn is a much larger rocket on the scale of a Saturn V, and he's offered to NASA that he thinks they can have sort of a a UPS or a FedEx type delivery service that would send cargo to the moon for an affordable amount if NASA or other people are interested in doing that with this type of a rocket. So there are companies that are willing to work with the government in doing things on the moon. One of the other highlights of the meeting in Australia last week was uh, Elon Musk from SpaceX who gave an update on his plans for a Mars colony. He is just focused on Mars, and he's had a lot of very innovative ideas over the years. His idea is to have a, a rocket that is codenamed BFR, and I'm not sure exactly what that stands for, but it's probably something like Big Freaking Rocket or something like that. And, and it's big. Um, it would have 31 engines on the first stage. The pressurized volume is greater than an Airbus A380. And if he's done his calculations correctly, you'd be able to, to fly that and then refuel that in Earth orbit and then land on the moon and come back. Or you could use that same rocket and fly to Mars if you able, are able to to generate some propellant from uh, the CO2 and, and other things that you find on Mars. And an interesting part of the presentation was he says, you know what, if, if you've got that rocket anyway, you can think about things like point-to-point -point transportation on the Earth so that you can get from one place to another on the planet in about a half an hour. And, you know, that's been something that people have talked about for a long time, and boy, after spending 26 hours on a plane to get to Australia, I would, was really hoping we had one of those, but the idea is, again, if you had one of these drone ships, you could just sort of fly it out in the harbor, uh, or coast, sail out in the harbor, and you have this takeoff, and you have, you know, 10 minutes of push back in your seats, and then 10-minute coast, and 10 minutes push back in your seats, and then you're on the other side of the world, and then those fancy little hydrofoil sails back into the port, and, and there you go. And if you believe the numbers again, he says that eventually he thinks that since this is completely reusable and you're only playing for the fuel, that you could get comparable to a, a full fare economy seat on an, an airliner. Now, again, a lot of skeptics, a lot of critics that say, oh, you can't do that or we shouldn't do that, but we're seeing a lot of very innovative, a lot of out-of-the-box concepts, and he's saying that that he can have that <coughs> flying by 2022. So that's only five years from now. So that is just a completely different time scale than the government is used to talking about when they're talking about systems like this. 
We're also seeing a lot of, of what we're calling new and non-traditional commercial operations being talked about. Things like commercial space stations, satellite servicing, whether you refuel or reposition satellites, commercial moon bases or asteroid mining. And what we're seeing is there's a lot of people that are stopping by our office and knocking on the door. Uh, excuse me, who do I go to to get permission to land my spacecraft on the moon? I don't know. We've, we've never had one of those before. <laughs> and it comes down to the Outer Space Treaty, which about 100 different countries have signed, and which says in Article 6 that the activities of non-governmental entities in outer space shall require authorization and continuing supervision by the government. And if you look at what we've got in place today, it's not clear what we should do for some of these new ideas. You see, the FAA has responsibility for licensing the launches and re-entries, but not for what happens in the plane. FCC, responsible for licensing radio broadcasts in space. NOAA, responsible for licensing DOD and NASA are obviously big players in space, but they're not regulatory agencies and they don't want to be. So who is supposed to authorize these things to happen? And right now, that's creating regulatory uncertainty. So these people that are spending their own money and they want to do, go do cool stuff, they're going, you know, can't somebody tell me this is okay, yes or no, or what I have to do? And if they don't get a good answer, they're going to go to some other country, like Luxembourg or whatever, and see if they can get somebody to say, sure, go ahead. And then they'll be more comfortable with the money that they're investing. So we, we think this is one of the issues that the new National Space Council really needs to deal with if we want to maintain our leadership in space. The government needs to clearly articulate what is the policy in terms of how we want these things to work. There's another important issue that's getting a lot of attention these days, and that's orbital debris. I don't know how many people saw the movie Gravity a few years back. Um, I saw it twice. I really enjoyed the movie. I know there were a lot of people that were <coughs> criticizing it, saying that the uh, authors took a few liberties with the laws of physics along the way and so forth. But I thought it was a pretty good movie and did a good job of, of all the graphics and the and the videos and the, and the scenes, especially showing what would happen when you had a bad day in space and you had a, a collision between two objects that were traveling at orbital velocity. And, and that is a very real thing that we need to be thinking about. So that brings up the subject of space traffic management, which is, is basically all the laws and rules and policies about trying to safely get to space and travel through space and return from space. And how do we want to do that? <coughs> right now, the Air Force keeps track of what's up there. And sort of as a, a side responsibility, they would send out collision warnings to people. Oh, by the way, you know, tomorrow you're going to have a close call with another satellite and so forth. But you know what? That, that is not their primary job. They, they don't want to be space traffic cops. They want to be the space warriors and think about national security challenges, and there's plenty of those to go around. So if you, if you talk to senior leadership at the Pentagon or other places, they're happy to get rid of the safety part of that job so that they can focus on the national security job. So FAA, we're, we're happy to take on that responsibility if the White House and the Congress agree. But certainly, again, somebody should be thinking about that as we go forward. We're talking about having a, a civil space traffic management system. So we're working very closely with the DOD on what that would look like. And our mission would be to, to enhance the safety of space operations and preserve the space environment. We don't want to have so many collisions and so much debris up there that basically space becomes unusable for the people in the future. There are a lot of questions that have been asked. How much would it cost? How accurate does it have to be? Can you really handle all the classified aspects of that and still be transparent and so forth? So we proposed having a pilot program where we try some of these things out and see if it works. And if it does, we'll transition that responsibility from DOD to the FAA. If it doesn't, we can just keep doing what we're doing. 
So that's a quick look at what's going on in commercial space. Uh, these next few years are going to be pretty exciting, really. Now that the shuttle's been retired, we're in a situation where we're going to do regular commercial cargo deliveries to the space station. <coughs> going to be some main test flights, uh, commercial crew transportation, the beginning of suborbital space tourism. We've got the first meeting of the International Space Council coming up on Thursday. The vice president will be part of that. We've got 12 other members, including <coughs> the state, Secretary of Defense, Secretary of Transportation, NASA administrators, several others, and they'll be talking about the civil space program, the commercial space program, the national security space program, and how can we work together as a nation to take advantage of all the talent and capabilities that we have. And speaking for the Office of the Commercial Space Transportation at the FAA, we're committed to doing our part to enable this exciting industry. So I'd be happy to take any questions you have. But before I do that, I've got a question for you. You ready to go? <laughs> so I'm about to blame the hard, I'm about to blame the hurricane again. Uh, usually I walk around with a microphone. I don't think there is one here. So if you don't mind when you ask your question, if you could speak loudly and clearly. Um, and uh, if it's not clear, maybe we can have George repeat it. There you go. George?
share your vision. I'd love to see that happen. And I think if, if we think about the best way to get there, then we have a chance of having that happen in the next few days. One, one thing I would add to that is that there's a conversation going on among some of us about, um, it's called the Cis Lunar Market. Place. It's been led by United Launch Alliance and Tori Bruno. And so there's sort of going to be a lot of that discussion at uh, Spacecom. But the idea is to develop that infrastructure. This lunar space means essentially the moon and the earth and stuff in between. And it's all the things that you talked about. And I think a lot of the things that you're saying, the, the obviously it's expensive. Private industry is interested because the potential for refueling and mining and all that sort of thing. But government's going to have to be part of it. And so the conversation is there, and I think it's been led by a lot of the things that you've talked about is, you know, it used to be science fiction. Now it's, now it's a potential business, and so people are really talking about it. So that's going to be happening over the next few years. It started at Spacecom last year. There's been a couple of meetings and a number of telecons since, and so there's people, people uh, talking about exactly that. Maybe not in low Earth orbit as much, but that low Earth orbit out to lunar orbit and, and so on. So, so maybe you'll find it in your office I, I think Mario's. I think Mario's looking for. A, I think Mario's looking for a job. Let's go here and then back over here. Yes, sir. Uh, can you elaborate on what work you've done with uh, Spaceport Houston so far and what you might envision over the next few years? All right, so again, we're not picking the location. We're, we're trying to encourage the result and promote. And so we talk about here's the requirement. And as we, as we talked about the different kinds of spaceports, the, the key question is,
And, and we have, I mean, we have strong connections. So at some point, um, we will, we can easily do a, a Houston Spaceport update. Um, you know, Turo comes pretty regularly, and every so often, things have been, there have been some things been happening um, that we're waiting to see how they transpire as to whether to, to come out and do something. So there's always stuff going on, and um, I'll leave the, the people who are doing it and take the credit for it to speak to that. But we'd have to set, we'll set that up. I'll, I'll, I'll make a promise to do that. Maybe not at the next one because it's more of a science talk and I won't be here, but um, maybe maybe before the Voyager one in November 16, maybe I can get these guys to commit, or at least one of them, to give a, a, maybe a 10 minute update on, this, on the spaceport activities. Because um, I think people in Houston are really interested in what's going on. They hear a lot about it, but they don't know the details. They think rockets are going to be flying out of Ellington Field and landing in the bayou, and that's not going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> so, there's a question here, and then I'll come back over here. Yes, sir. First of all, I want to say what a very excellent lecture and presentation. Uh, we're, we're really fortunate to be in Houston at Rise to be able to have great guys like you show up. This is so provocative. About, I mean, my, my head is swimming here with questions. I can't even keep up with my own questions. But, but let me just say, I was touched at the very beginning. There's a little something you said there about uh, the United States government. No, he meant Luxembourg. Luxembourg, that was Luxembourg <laughs> and not Russia or France or Spain. You know. In other words, uh, you could go to get some small company to give you the permission to go do something if you needed some sort of reason or whatever. Well, uh, one thing I see here is you don't have much choice. The government, the government had better be in uh, in concert with a free enterprise because I don't think they have any choice. It, it, I'm just wondering to what extent can the United States or any other government <coughs> put its foot down at all? I mean, there's, there's too much money involved. So a lot of the question really had to do with private companies versus the government and who does what and how come and so forth. And let me sort of briefly set the stage there. So the licenses we give don't cost money, they're free. You just but you have to come and get a license from us. And why did the government do that? Because under the Outer Space Treaty, any US citizen or company that is launching, no matter where they're launching, is responsible for the damage that they might do. So the, the US government is on the hook. So to, to cover their tail, they say, well, since we're going to be responsible if something wrong happens, we're going to make sure that you do it safely. And so that's what the license process is all about. So anybody that's going to launch needs a launch license. What we're talking about here is, yeah, but what about after the launch? What about all that stuff in space or landing on the moon or something? Right now, there is no clearly articulated policy as to whether somebody should ever see that. And again, some people would say, well, I don't trust the government. Why should there be anybody who has to do that? Fine, that's one point of view. But if you're in a company, you're saying, you know, that's fine, but just tell me what you want me to do <laughs> and I'll do it because I don't want to have somebody stand up at the last minute after I spent all my time and money designing my lunar rover, and suddenly somebody stands up and says, you can't do that, so tell me what the rules are. And uh, again, if the US government doesn't do it, some other country will end up taking the lead on that. So that's why I'm encouraging us to figure this out so that private industry can be successful. I mean, one of George's challenges is that this is moving faster than legislation moves. And I mean, even the Outer Space Treaty says you cannot own the moon. But people are talking about mining stuff on the moon. So there's a big issue is, well, you're not saying that the moon is yours and you can dig some of it and sell it. But that's what exactly, but, but that's what exactly what they're trying to do is mine the water, break it into hydrogen, oxygen, and sell it for fuel in space. There's no law that covers that because nobody envisaged that. And these guys are sort of, 
It's, hey, it's your job, man, do it. And it doesn't, so it's a really interesting, it's a really interesting world we're living in when it comes to this. And I think that's where, you know, if I register your confusion, it's shared by the rest of us. Because, because things are moving so fast. It sounds cool and it sounds great, but who's to say that you can, you set your company up in the moon and you're digging up your water and along comes another company that are bigger and have more security people and kick you off and drill the water from you. I mean, uh, and, you know, so there's things that legislation that have to be put to, in place to make all of this happen and happen safely and profitably for the people who invest. Uh, Question here and then one back here. Space Industry Bill came out of the House of Lords in the UK that's passing over to the House of Commons, and a lot of the language in there comes right out of their playbook, so uh, see the sense in it. Um, there was a question, I know there's one at the back, there's a question down near this, sir. Wes. Thank you. 
inspectors and for space force, we, we go out and visit at least once a year to make sure that everybody is living up to what they said they were going to do in the application and the regulations and, and the law and so forth. Um, that, that really hasn't been an issue. There's, there's no requirement that, that you have activity, and so there's not a lot going on in some of their space force. It's sort of a chicken and egg thing. Do you wait until there's a rocket and then we start building the space force, or do you build the space force first? And, the people in New Mexico were saying, come on guys, we, we were ready to go several years ago, but Virgin Galactic isn't quite ready yet. So, I mean, that's, again, we, we try not to look at the economics, we're not picking winners and losers, it's, it's up to the individual location in terms of what do they need, what do they want to do, how elaborate, how fancy, how expensive do they want to be, and we'll provide feedback and advice, but we're not setting requirements. So a question at the back here, and then Adrian, you can have the last one. Two more Thank questions. Thank you for your wonderful lecture, sir, and welcome to the great state of Texas. Thank you. Um, as I understand it, roughly eight years ago, China had no high-speed rail. Now, the, the Chinese high-speed rail system is greater than all the other high-speed rail systems in the world combined. Are you seeing, in your administration and your colleagues, seeing a similar incline in the development of the Chinese space systems and space industry? And if so, how, would, how can we respond to that? So China has launched people into space. Um, they have a lot of ambitions. They have a space station now. They've talked about wanting to, to go to the moon and come um, to other places. Uh, it appears that their current effort is governmental and mostly related to their military interests, but there are a lot of people that are very concerned about the capabilities that they're developing and the fact that, that they have plenty of ambition and if, for example, the U.S. doesn't want to deal with them or we don't want them to be part of the International Space Station program, then they'll just go off and do their own and they'll give out bribes or, or space or invite other countries to work with them. So that's one of the challenges that we have in the U.S. You know, it's very nice to say, well, we'll just do our own thing. But if we don't want to fly, if we don't want to go back to the moon, then other countries are going to say, hey, well, come with us. We're going to go do some fun things, and you can be part of that group. So that, that's something that a number of people in Congress and also in the government are certainly worried about that. So the last question, Adrian, you have a question. So there's been talks in Congress lately about Putting up the, uh, the Space Command and the Air Force to the U.S. Space, space Force. So, do you see change in the FDA and the FAA space regulatory, uh, I guess, component? You know, kind of splitting off into its own regulatory agency, or is that that come in so down the line? Great question. Um, well, is our office eventually going to split off from the FAA or something? I think that's, that's possible. There's there's talk about potentially going back to the Department of Transportation and being a, a separate mode of transportation, just like air and sea and rail and road and so forth. Uh, right now, though, we're pretty small. We have like 100 people out of 45,000 in all of the FAA, and our, our budget is, again, less than a tenth of 1% of the FAA's budget to do what we do, even though there's still a lot of different areas that are involved. So uh, certainly, I think someday we may see a Department of Space or a federal Aerospace administration or whatever, but uh, right now it seems to be looking pretty well where we are. Pretty close. Can I point out two quick takeaways? So, Dr. Neal's my boss, and uh, he's great, and if you didn't recognize this, this is the future. I, I transferred over from NASA after a 20-year career. I've been with FA for five years now, and part of it is because of this vision that, and leadership that Dr. Neal has provided. And the other thing is Three comments before you go. Um, I just want to point out there's only three flags on the moon right now a US flag, a Chinese flag, and a rice flag. 
I'll tell you the story about that some other time. So there's three flags in the moon, one of them's a rice one. Um, our next talk is October 26. And tomorrow, how many know what tomorrow is? 60th anniversary of Sputnik. Space started 60 years ago last uh, tomorrow. So um, celebrate it whatever way you like. You drink some vodka. <laughs> yeah, do whatever you need. But thanks again. Hopefully we'll see you in the process.